welcome to Clock Convos. Uh, today we're with Ruben Hindel, um, one of our mentors, and um, we're really fascinated to kind of share his story and, and just talk a little more about his entrepreneurial journey and um, the different businesses that he's been involved in. So Ruben, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot. Pleasure to be here. Hey guys, this is Sheila and Maya Dunn, and you're listening to Clock Combos. <laughs> Um, we wanted to just sort of start by basically giving you um, the opportunity to explain your story from, so Ruben's also a Colgate alumni, um, the story of, yeah, the Colgate, <laughs> um, kind of when you graduated, kind of walk us through what you were planning to do when you graduated to like how that evolved and, you know, where you are today. Sure, I'll, I'll get you to the sort of beginning of what became my career, yeah. which in and of itself will take a little while. So we'll start there. Okay. Um, I was uh, actually always a kind of a sales guy and uh, worked uh, selling uh, ski equipment in ski shops for uh, actually when I was in high school. Uh, and then actually when I was up at, at college, it was a part-time job. I used to sell uh, in a ski shop in Utica. So I was always kind of like a sales guy. And uh wanted to kind of expand that and see where that would take me. So it kind of got me into a business mode. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, some very big companies were interviewing on campus for uh, sort of to learn how to sell and what I would call consultative selling. So, you know, how to sort of do deeper selling that requires strategy and at a higher level. Mm -hmm. Those companies still around, IBM was one of those companies. Eight, the, uh, another version of AT&T was another of those companies uh, and ended up uh, actually joining a training program in sales with AT&T at the time. And uh, just so I could learn really what uh, kind of complete what they called consultative selling was. And listen, I think selling and, and learning how to sell, I think we all sell all the time. Mm -hmm. And I will say, well, we're probably not going to get to it. But I look back on my career and some people say like, well, what were you? What are you? Uh, I'm really in some ways a salesperson or a client relationship person, probably more than anything else. Um, so just that ability to develop rapport, to listen to people, to have good conversations like you guys are developing right here, obviously, but really that ability of kind of to develop that is a really great skill, I think, no matter where you are. Anyway, uh, so I did that for a, a few years and that was pretty rewarding. And then I realized I wanted to go more into marketing. So kind of get out of the sort of direct at the time face-to-face -face selling and, and become a little bit more strategic uh, in my head. Uh, so I went to business school. And when I graduated from business school, I went to work. Actually, I interned at American Express uh, at that time. And uh, in between first and second year. And then when I graduated, I went to, I took a job with American Express uh, full-time and worked there for several years. And... Um, where things kind of got different was I was, we were actually working with a couple of different smaller uh, consulting agencies in the, uh, at the time, direct marketing space, you would call it digital marketing today, which is what it is, but this was before digital, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, working with uh, data and analytics and those kinds of things at the time, which is a lot easier today than it was then. Uh, anyway, I was working with a couple of small consulting shops who kind of were doing things in a, in a new way, uh, kind of in a, in a breakthrough way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I needed to get some stuff done that didn't seem so easy to get done. So I hired them and they really were using some really cool at the time, new technology to do things around analytics uh, and data, which was a big part of it, kind of direct marketing at the time at American Express. And, uh, you know, it really started to work. And so I really did, um, I really embraced that technology and, and I actually used it uh, doing what I did. And then people next to me started using that technology too, because they saw it was kind of working. So, you know, kind of like lesson number one, almost a little bit was like, I was, I was entrepreneurial, even in a big company, I was sort of doing things in a, or at least entrepreneurial or creative maybe. Mm -hmm. And so it ended up being that my whole group 
uh, which was the small business card, the American Express small business card, my whole group of 40 marketers ended up using this technology uh, and I kind of helped them learn how to use it. Uh, so, which became my job, which was funny enough at mm -hmm. American Express, like just go help people do better marketing with this stuff. And then the company said to me, do you want to come and be our head of our head of sales and marketing? And this was like a small 10 person company. So this was sort of the big get out of corporate and, mm -hmm. and do the risky entrepreneurial, practically a startup kind of thing. But I knew it well, obviously, given that I'd been working with them for like more than a year. And so went and started there and worked there for uh, close to five years. And, uh, and then from there actually got recruited to a bigger, to a marketing agency at the time, what was called the direct marketing agency. And uh, that agency, uh, so I went and joined that agency and we turned that agency into what is today the largest uh, digital marketing agency in the world, uh, which is named Digitas. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, so, but when I joined them, it was 200 folks still a lot bigger than I was involved with. One office in Boston, again, a little bit of a risk that turned out really well. And, and from there, that just kind of kept rolling. But uh, that was how I started. What was that switch like for you from more of the corporate world into the riskier startup world? Was it like a hesitation or did you have a calling for it, do you think? I, you know, to be honest, wouldn't say I necessarily had a calling for it. Um, but I think that uh, a lot of my entrepreneurship and risk taking, I think if I look back has been driven by not wanting to be bored. Uh, mm -hmm. And I have a kind of really low boredom tolerance or high boredom tolerance, whichever way that works. And I think just intuitively, I was ready to do something big corporation while I've been moving quickly in it and doing very well. You know, I just kind of saw a lot more that could be done and maybe the instinct at the time, which I didn't really realize was going from being kind of like a client who, you know, spends money and hires and in a big corporation to being on the services side mm -hmm. where you get to, you know, you have to work with lots of different people, help lots of different people, which again, I started to do at American Express when I was using this technology mm -hmm. uh, and some more intuitively sort of felt like that would be a place for me uh, as a next step, but it was partly that, and it was partly just to try a smaller, a smaller business and kind of take that risk. Uh, if it's kind of like, if not, then when, uh, back then, I would tell you that it's not like it's been the last 10, 20 years where kind of entrepreneurship is the way to go and everybody's starting everything and everybody's moving. So to do it back then was a, was a, was a bit more daunting. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I just kind of didn't, quite frankly, think too much about it and just decided to just try something new. So you joined Digitas at a, as like a 200 person team. How, what was your transition and growth like to, from 200 to the world's largest agency? You know, how yeah. did you do that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good, it's a very good question. And I certainly didn't do it alone. Right. Uh, but a few of us, uh, and actually, digital started in 1995 when mm -hmm. I joined. So there is now, and we start to sort of mod current world, if you will, uh, in terms of the digital world. Uh, and we were there at the right time. And there are a lot of smart people there. Uh, digital kind of came upon everybody. And by the way, that came in the form of just the Microsoft browser being born. Um, and so all of a sudden there was this whole new thing. We were all you know, kind of data analytic types and kind of direct marketing types. So we saw digital as this incredible opportunity, uh, probably, you know, more aggressively and more strategically than maybe many others did. I was working with a lot of former consultants uh, who had found their way to this, we're a smarter agency than everybody else up in Boston in that sort of academic environment. So again, certainly not just me and a lot of people there. And we started to kind of get this vision and we started to talk to, you know, big company clients about like, you better get on this digital path here. This is going to be the future of, of the world. And so we were just lucky to uh, sort of be together, have this focus 
have some great big client relationships where clients were listening to us and, you know, just kind of built from there. Um, it just kind of built from there. And that was, you said, was that around 95 or is this a little later on? Yeah. So that began in 95 really. And we took the company public in 2001. So, uh, and I actually spent most of my time uh, personally, we had one office in Boston and I would go uh, back to the sales part of this uh, equation uh, and client side. I really became kind of more the client relationship person. And so we won the American Express business in New York and I went and opened the New York office. We won the Charles Schwab business in San Francisco and I went and opened the San Francisco office. And then we won the Allstate business in Chicago and I opened that office and opened and then ran each one for a year. So just had this super lucky time and uh, my, my wife and family were flexible enough. I would just get on a plane, basically commute every week and build these offices around these anchor clients mm -hmm. for about a year, get them going, get them to scale. And then we'd hire somebody to go run the office. And then, you know, I'd come home and then did it again. And I did that literally from 1997 to 2001 and built the North American footprint for Digitas. So how do you see, so obviously you mentioned timing a few times, like, you know, like I'm, that's 95, you know, 2001. So now I'm curious, kind of like today, um, he, in a way you were almost ahead of the, like you were right with the times, like project, predicting correctly. And I feel like people still, even in early 2020, we're still like not even fully convinced of digital marketing. So I guess my question is, how do you think the pandemic has just accelerated the digital transformation and maybe what's next for it? Yeah, well, it's, it's actually a fascinating data point for me to hear that you think from your vantage point, knowing what you're exposed to, um, and, and you still see, I guess, clients that don't kind of fully embrace the digital world, as I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, and then that's why you're able to say that, which is like incredible to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, and, and I would say what I would share with you, not so much in the digital marketing space, because I just look at media consumption um, and time spent. And, you know, from day one, right, there were these tracking studies about, you know, spend, right, what clients are spending and where they're spending versus media consumption where people are spending their time consuming and you had these massive imbalances, right? Like, you know, so people were spending pretty early on like three, four hours a day on the internet. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, you know, digital marketing was 5% of, uh, of a company's budget, right? So that's literally, you know, how it started, right? And, and then things were starting to balance out. I think today it's pretty, you know, in the last already five years, that's pretty balanced out. And you know, that's a big trend that I look at. Um, so if you sort of cut through, you know, well, how much should advertisers be spending in digital, right? You know, well, I, I, it should be based on where people are spending their time, I would think, and where you get people and where the highest ROI is, obviously. But, you know, that's pretty normalized now. And, you know, kind of newspapers are kind of going, print newspapers have, are the last things to kind of fade away because nobody's really reading paper anyway. Um, but then where I've spent the last, more 10 years of, of my career has been more actually in the digital transformation, let's call it e-commerce space. Mm -hmm. So more on the platform side versus the marketing side, which was the first 20 years. And mm -hmm. there I would say, you know, e-commerce, I always felt, so I'll put this in e-commerce terms. In other words, I always felt that e-commerce was lagging in that, wow, everybody's, you know, buying online. Um, but but why aren't you implementing, you know, the right e-commerce solutions? Why aren't you embracing your clients where, where they are and where they're shopping? Mm -hmm. Now, at some level, you know, e-commerce even today is only 18% of retail. So you could argue that just like the media consumption and spending, people were spending the right amount of focus because people are still, you know, uh, up until, well, up until the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. It was, it was only, um, uh, about 12% uh, of spend was online and the rest was kind of more traditional bricks and mortar. Um, and, and so maybe that was the right amount of time, but again, still like you just know intuitively it's, it's, it's gotta be more than that. You gotta focus more on that. 
And then what happened last year, as I'm sure you know, is we got 10 years of e-commerce growth in six months. Yeah. And so that actually went from a 12% share to 18% share. Uh, but what it also did is it just finally broke the dam because not only did it grow share, but I think, you know, the world's consumers were home. So it just, you know, everybody, every consumer now and again. So, you know, one theme that's emerging here that I would have your listeners make sure is all of this, especially when it comes to marketing, but really when it comes to almost to most things people do, at least from a consumer perspective in this world, you know, you got to follow what consumers are doing, right? You got to know what they're doing to kind of know. And consumers are always first. So, you know, not, under, not just understanding where they are today, but where are consumers going? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can follow that. You can't go wrong. You can never go wrong if you follow consumers. Uh, anyway, to answer your question, maybe a little bit more specifically, I think that, uh, you know, what, what uh, the companies I work with and in the various different ways now that I work with companies and I work with uh, private equity firms that are buying businesses and, and, and all of that, you know, I think everybody's got it now. Um, I think everybody's got it now. And so companies are pouring, uh, just pouring money into digital transformation, customer experience today. And um, a lot of them are playing catch up to where the consumer is. Right. Are there any consumer trends, um, like you mentioned, following the consumer, are there any trends right now that you see whether in media or e-commerce that you would say follow or get ahead of? Yeah, well, I just, you know, I think the one that we were just talking about for sure is, um, you know, where, where e-commerce spending went up to, you know, 18%, which was dramatic. Um, it probably could have gone more and faster if there was more and better places for people to spend their money online while everybody was kind of locked away at home. And so, uh, you know, when you look at Amazon taking outsized share of that spend, um, that's because there are just not as many other great places, you know, to, 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 to buy, to shop and buy. I think that's all changing. And I think we're seeing that. So, you know, the, the first thing is kind of e-commerce is finally uh, moving to the front of the line relative to how people think about selling things to consumers and businesses, by the way. So B2B commerce is, uh, you know, th those are the two biggest changes, I think, uh, with that happening, you know, the other consumer trend that people are seeing, and again, I see a lot of this, not just from looking at consumer trends, but from what uh, businesses that consult to companies or that work with companies, what they're kind of focusing on and where the gaps are. Uh, you know, I think the other big trend is, is, is actually tying all of the data together uh, and the need to try all the data together uh, because you now have people really who, you know, still are out there shopping and buying what's called offline, but are, you know, now increasingly shopping online. You've got, you know, brands that have never, you know, worried too much about what the online behavior was, not just shopping, but all the online behavior. They've been willing to keep that separate. Uh, it's small. We don't worry about it. This is still all about kind of what what the in-store shopper is doing or, or what have you. I think that's changing. I think even in, in the worlds of, of what I think is still called social media, um, but, but in those worlds and you know, that world is just morphing and you know, constantly, right? It's, it's, more of a, it's more of a perspective of you know, how are people, where are people that are on Instagram? You know, what, what are they doing there? What are they going to Pinterest? what are they buying, you know, then are they going to Facebook? So like tying the consumer picture together is becoming a lot more important in part because, you know, new use case platforms are popping up, you know, all the time and, and have been, you know, and now, you know, I look at like Clubhouse now as like, you know, one of the latest things like literally didn't exist, I think a year ago. Yeah. And now everybody's talking about, okay, everybody's spending all their time on Clubhouse. Well, like, it just happened. And then, and then there'll be the next one and then there'll be the next one and then there'll be the next one. So I think as things get in, in some ways, more people spending their time digitally, whether it's buying or just engaging and entertaining um, platforms are proliferating, um, you know, how uh, certainly from a business and brand perspective, let's say, not just from a pure consumer where people are hanging out, but, you know, from 
you know, I kind of typically tend to look at it, frame it because my, my business is really helping companies figure out how to take advantage of trends, right. And, and what they should be doing to, to, to match these trends. Um, you know, they've, they've got to increasingly understand the broader picture and that's now gotten thrown for a loop because, you know, we're going to lose cookies, right. Yeah. As you probably know, we're going to lose cookies. And so it's going to be weird. There's been this uphill battle, like how do you tie the world of cookies together and whole industries and businesses that have been created and certainly methodologies for how people were doing that based on third-party available cookie data, which is now going away. So it's going to get really weird. So once again, the thing it's, everything's going to get thrown up and thrown up in the air. You, um, you talk a lot about reducing complexity, like helping your clients reduce the complexity of all of this, right? Tying it all yep. together. And I was, uh, I saw this quote that was about either you significantly up level the digital literacy of the employees and teaching them how to like code and be programmers themselves, or you drastically simplify and reduce the complexity. So do you think that I'm just curious because I, I live in the digital age, you know, agency world. Do you think people are going to be more digitally literate or are we going to have more agents, you know, more spend with digital agencies or both? Yeah, are, are you implying that uh, the greater the digital literacy is, the less people will need help from digital agencies? Is that what you're kind of asking? A little bit. Well, I mean, like a lot of these platforms, even like Squarespace or Shopify are so user friendly, you know, anyone can kind of create a website from scratch. I, I guess I'm wondering if, I, I think it's going to be both. There's always going to be people to help you execute on these different channels and software, like both what my, and my company do. Um, but I also think a real potential is just platforms that make it user friendly for the average person to kind of understand these digital technologies a little bit better. No, I completely agree. And one of my favorite stories is there's a great agency out there. It's a global agency called Overdose. Um, and I, I know the CEO somewhat. And I was uh, actually doing a TIA. I was actually doing a, a mentoring session on e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for thoughts on, you know, from folks that are still running agencies like yourself on the front line, like, what are you telling people, right? Because I want to I want to share some of that, right? I want to crib some of their, some of their knowledge, right? I don't just want to, you know, make it up myself. <laughs> and uh, so I was, you know, asking him that, and his response to me was, you know, it's so super easy. Look, here's, he sent me a link to his ten-year-old daughter's site, yeah. and she created a seed business, you know, like vegetable seed, like gardening seed business, in New Zealand because they're in New Zealand. She created, so he said, hey, just look what my 10 year old daughter created yeah. and like blew my mind. I mean, this was like a, a fully formed business. Forget the website. It was yeah. like a fully formed business and a great website. So I completely agree with you. And that was his 10 year old daughter. So wow. that's how I actually opened my presentation. Um, but what I've found again in my career you know, technology does keep getting simpler, yeah. but, and so the, 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 the goalposts keep moving in terms of where people need help and where there's value to add. And, mm -hmm. you know, as technology gets simpler, that opens up opportunities in terms of creating a better consumer experience, et cetera. That opens up all kinds of things. New platforms are emerging all the time. And so, there's, there's so much change in, um, in the world that, you know, uh, companies are always looking for help from those that kind of are at the front end of that, right? They have to, or, or are closer to the consumer behavior and can translate that into whatever the company does, whatever you help your companies do. Mm -hmm. uh, and they always need help uh, because there's always new things to, to master, um, and then, of course, sometimes they always need help because they just need, you know, they, they need bodies, right? They need people to get work done, right? So, so, th but there's always from an innovation perspective, there's always from an expertise perspective, there's always a huge amount of room for 
strategic value add, right? And so, uh, or whatever kind of value add. Um, you know, so companies are willing to pay for it, but it's got to be something they don't do, right? So, yeah, so there'll be less need to pay to, you know, even just the cost of implementing, you know, not just Squarespace or Wix, but, you know, the cost of implementing Salesforce Commerce Cloud, which is, you know, a pretty much a, a close to enterprise grade piece of, of you know, technology, that's getting simpler. So, you know, e-commerce service businesses that are building websites for people, you know, don't have to spend as much time just, you know, getting it up and going, right? So table stakes keep getting raised. Right. So, so you've got to keep, you know, figuring out where the value add is. You've got to keep looking forward more than your competition. Uh, so that if, again, if you're in the service business so that you can be of help, right? Is there any, um, like we hear a lot of people say, like you can't do everything perfectly or like you can't do it all as a service business. But when you're trying to like innovate and always have a value add and and like adapt to what businesses need, is there like like how can you create your scope of services or your suite of services while staying with what the consumer needs, but also not like distracting yourself? I mean, you got to have a plan. I mean, you, you you have to have a plan, and that plan has to be based on, you know, your insight into uh, not just where things are going, right? And not just where things are, but also a plan relative to how you're going to, you know, capture and go after those opportunities or let other people do it, right? And, you know, and you've got to understand, you know, moving into adjacencies, what I'd call adjacencies as the world evolves and as a services business deciding, you know, what you're going to start doing, what you're going to stop doing, um, you know, what you're going to partner with other people to do, um, you know, is, is, is part of the art of growing an effective services business. And if you don't have unlimited amount of money to invest in that business, which if you don't have a lot of outside funding, you don't, um, you know, you've got to make choices and you've got to make smart choices and, um, and you have to hopefully not get unlucky. Um, one of the things I would say just as, as, as a way of advice is, the other thing is to, if you make the wrong choices and you kind of walk yourself into a corner, um, that's a real problem, especially if you're not like a large services business. So um, if you bet on a particular technology that then, you know, 40% of your practice is focused on that technology and that technology all of a sudden falls out of favor, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a big hit, you know, and that happens all the time. So you know, one of the things about the plan I would, I would advocate, and, you know, and I've had to do this with many, you know, with the four organizations I built and ran and grew in a very fast changing, you know, digital from day one to digital from now year, whatever it is, 26, um, is try, you know, try and avoid walking yourself into a corner. Really try, like spend a lot of time trying to game theory that and, or just think about it and, you know, make multiple bets or, um, you know, always leave yourself an out or, you know, just try and think through that. I mean, you can't, you, and sometimes you just get unlucky and, you know, something looks like it's going to be around forever and you've built that expertise and then it changes. But, but I would say what separates the, you know, it's better to be lucky than good. But, you know, the other comment is, um, you know, luck is, you know, from those who, you know, you know, as a result of hard work, right. It's not, it's not just luck. So like do the work, do the work, and then you got to make your bets, right? Do the work, make your bets, keep yourself nimble and flexible. Mm -hmm. You've clearly been able to grow agency models very successfully. And there's just, so, there's all this talk about it, how, how do you scale an agency? The very first day I started John Goodwin, my dad was like, don't do that. It's not scalable. Um, create software, create a product. So, right. um, I, my question is, and I, I re, uh, watched a few like interviews that you've done about the different acquisitions you make or you know, your companies were making. So the question I guess is like, how do you think about scaling an agency or a services business other than yeah. just hiring, you know, talent? Right. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a big question obviously and multifaceted, mm -hmm. I guess. Give me a, a little bit more of a hint. Are you thinking 
in terms of how do you do it profitably? How do you do it as fast as you can? Like when you, when you, like, what's the context for that question? How do you differentiate yourself, I suppose? position um, in order to grow because you know we continue to compete um, with all these other agencies offering a similar service. Um, it, I guess my goal would be for, for our agency is to be able to offer something slightly different than what all these other agencies are doing in order to grow and out you know far yeah. see what they're doing. So, so, so I have one easy like high level response to that. Um, but, and we can drill down to make it real because it, it's, it's, it's a, it's more real than what it's going to sound like. So, um, so I kind of created this approach to this, um, which I call, uh, creating a win strategy. So the definition of a win strategy is if you're in a competitive pitch with five other agencies mm -hmm. and the, the company you're pitching to um, understand three that your win. So your win strategy translates to I'm going to win this pitch because done Goodwin does this, 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 and this differently, better, what have you. Mm -hmm. Right. But it, which, which implies there's some differentiation there that sticks out, right. That, that is a competitive advantage. Right. So, so a win strategy that by the way, can be a win pitch strategy, right? But, but like a win strategy, done Goodwin creates capabilities that ladder up into a set of capabilities that when you're talking to a client and they understand what you're saying, right? So they have to understand it and they have to buy it, right? Believe in it, buy it, mm -hmm. right? That you would always win versus the other five. Mm -hmm. So what is it about, to put it in practical terms, what what is done goodwin's win strategy that gives you the confidence you and your team the confidence that when you walk into a room and you articulate um that we do this and this and this and this and that's significantly different and better than another agency right um that that where you'll actually win mm -hmm. so so i guess it it's kind of saying what is your differentiation strategy that's that's true and real and that you can articulate to a client um, so that uh, so that there's no so that you're not a commodity right you're not one of the other four agencies that there's actually something different and special mm -hmm. and that does two things for you well it does many different things for you one it forces you to come up with why you're different and special mm -hmm. so it forces you to come up with that competitive advantage right number one yeah. number two, it's it differentiates you in terms of what you're you know what when you're talking to a client in a pitch like what you're saying it's not you know we do analytics and we do great creative and we do this mm -hmm. and then like but we do it really well right like because everybody's saying that typically right so there's no differentiation there so come up with something is there a process that you can create that sounds, you know, that is different, right? And sounds different. Is there an approach to doing something that is different? Is there a consumer insight that you're banking the whole thing on? We know, we know, we know the consumers who spend their time on these three better than anybody. Why? Well, because this is what we do, blah, blah, blah. Like whatever it is, make it compelling, make it stand out, make it as legitimate as possible. Mm -hmm. And you'll be having a different conversation with people because you'll focus them. You're, you're in that way creating, you know, right now when you pitch, it's, um, it's somebody else's game, right? You're, it, it's, the, it's the client's game, right? I mean, that's the nature of this, right? But if you create a real win strategy that you believe in and has true resonance and has some meaningfulness to it, you're in essence changing the rules of the game. And you're saying, you know, we speak this language. That's what we do. That's what Done Good One does. We speak this language, um, and that's what we do. And you, you know, and we do it, and it it yields much better results for our clients because we speak this language. I'm making it up, right? But you know, yeah. I'm just saying something. We speak this language. I'm like, now, if somebody else walks in the 
walks in the room and sa- happens to say they speak that language too, well, okay, then you're definitely still competing against them, mm-hmm. right? But but if nobody else does and they won't because this will be different, right. and you convince the client that because you speak this language, you're just a different agency, then at least you're competing kind of on your terms. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, one of the other ways I like to think about it is about changing the rules of the pitch game is you, you're trying to not make it a fair fight. I used to say, I'm not good enough to win a fair fight. <laughs> um, I, I wanna create a fight that's not fair, right? And I don't mean that it, yeah. literally, right? But you get the point. So like a win strategy that you think is unique and differentiated, um, and that is somewhat unique and differentiated, you're, you're, you're changing the nature of the pitch process all by itself. I mean, obviously Maya, this goes for you too. Um, so, you know, just come up, what is your win strategy? The other, the third thing that the win strategy does, if you're still tracking the first two things that it does, the third thing that it does is it gives your team um, much more confidence mm-hmm. in pitching. Um, because they're holding on to something that is unique. And, you know, it's very hard, you know, it's a very weird, you know, it's like, let me show you my three creative cases. And like, I hope they think it's better. And I hope it is better Mm -hmm. than the other agencies. But, Mm -hmm. you know, those are hard things to know, to know that you're better or different about. Those are just hard things. And you might be the best. I'm sure you are. But a maybe you're not and B those are hard things to feel like you've got it nailed. Right. Especially you're competing against bigger agencies. You're going to, so just come up with something, believe in it, let it have some reality to it and just try that. Okay. Win strategy. Yeah. 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 It's um, you'll know it when you come up with it mm-hmm. uh, because it's this thing that'll come together. You're going to force yourself to bring things together under some, perspective or process or whatever then you're gonna you know you're gonna believe it right like wow like that does sound cool right that 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 is different than what i think these other agencies are saying mm-hmm. and you know and again you want to build as much real value into that as possible i'm not saying it just make it up right and it's not just words but it, you know it'll force you to differentiate some way so it's about differentiating and then articulating that differentiation and having the confidence that if you if that's what you want, Mr. Client, potential client, you can only buy that from me. Mm-hmm. By definition, you can only buy this from me because I'm the only one that's talking about it this way. Right. So, and you know, you can say that too. Like that's a that's a way to change the rules of the game a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then it, of course you got to execute it, which means you got to have a good, you know, something good and different. Yeah. Yeah, it all comes back to kind of that that sales strategy that you're talking about at the beginning and having that yep. ability to pitch and, and win a deal. You remember that discussion we had two years ago about, right, going to Boston? Yeah, yeah, yep. I do. <laughs> Use what you have, differentiate it. Yeah. Yep. Um, one, of, one other question I have, um, I, I know we've kind of been grilling you about like, questions. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so um, what has been, um, one of your favorite roles that you you've had? Yeah, so uh, my favorite role is, has been being CEO and it's a little weird. I like became a CEO relatively early in my professional services career and then just did that several times so that I actually sort of pretty early, even though I was in a services business and having to oversee creating win strategies and all that kind of stuff, Mm-hmm. Um, I it kind of became more of a professional services CEO than I was like everybody, like people that I knew when I was younger, they're like, are you still this marketer, right? They would have marketing questions. They would ask me and like after a while when you're running bigger and bigger organizations, like I'm no longer the tactical marketing expert. I'm mm-hmm. more the CEO expert. So um, I, I love being a CEO uh, because I love teaching. I love mentoring. Um, I, I, lo- I like coaching. I like helping other people and, um, and I was okay at it. And so my favorite role was being CEO and, you know, having the authority for sure. You know, I love making decisions. I, um, I, they don't scare me at all. It's like a intellectual challenge for me. So Mm -hmm. if, you know, so 
so therefore it made it enjoy it. Like some people just like, don't want to make a decision. Like, I don't, I don't have a problem. You know, I don't have a problem because I feel like I'm prepared to make the decisions. And I also just as an insight, you didn't ask about, it's like when you're running an organization and you have to make decisions, I, I would say, think of two things as a leader. Maybe this will be useful for the audience. You know, one is most of the time you won't know whether there was a better decision to be made or whether you made the right or wrong decision most of the time because it's not like a case study where like you're, you're doing an a and b split and you're going to see which one works better right so just remember that like like you don't know whether you're going to make the right decision anyway so like don't be worried about making it number one number two ask yourself who better to make the decision than you i mean why aren't you the best person to make that decision um, so some people might be watching this and go, boy, that guy's arrogant. Um, and it's not arrogance. It's just, it's more assertiveness. It's just, it's just liking the leadership role and kind of embracing that. And, you know, the two aspects of that, that I really enjoyed were the coaching mentoring part of it. Um, people tended to resonate with how I did that. And that's really gratifying, um, more and more gratifying kind of building their skills up and building their capabilities versus mine. Uh, and then, um, you know, embracing kind of making decisions, but, you know, making it like enjoyable, like, like just being voracious for what decisions can I make so we can like move, mm -hmm. you know, and, and not slowing down because you have to make a decision. I mean, making smart ones though, for sure. And doing your homework. I'm also very analytic, but like, but then just, you know, shoot it, you know, just pull the trigger. Right. That's great advice. Yeah. Um, and do you have any other questions, Sheila, before we're kind of running out of time, but any last? Um, we typically ask kind of just, you've hit on a lot of different great kind of lessons that you've learned. If you were just finishing kind of your business schools, getting into American Express, you know, rewinding um, back to then. Is there any piece of advice you'd give to your young yourself then um, to kind of that you've learned or anything like that that you would think would set someone up for success? Yeah, I I, I don't know whether it would set somebody up for success or not, but the one thing I would say that in retrospect I. I guess I did, but I wasn't aware of it at the time. So a consciousness of this might be helpful to somebody was I, I actually, and I actually took a lot of risks. I was actually pretty aggressive in, in taking new opportunities on mm -hmm. probably in retrospect more than I had any right to be. Um, and I didn't re maybe realize it at the time, but certainly in my nature that made me assertive and somewhat risk-taking. Risk things worked out pretty well. Nothing worked out, per, you know, not everything's perfect, but things worked out pretty well. So when I look back, like just kind of understanding that, uh, you know, there, again, assuming you wanna hit a triple or a home run in your career versus, you know, it's okay to just wanna hit singles. It's okay, like mm -hmm. it's okay to wanna hit singles, but if you, most people like have this dream. They want to be really successful. They want to really, you know, move. And I, I would say, um, luckily for me, I guess I had some whatever series of events or personality that, that, that let me take what in retrospect looked like not conventional, somewhat risky moves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, going to an agency in Boston from a successful uh, five-year consulting career when I left American Express to go to the smaller business, go into some agency in Boston of 200 people. I mean, why did I do that? Like, you know, I mean, sure, I saw opportunity, but really, why did I do that? Um, and then like, wow, you know, then we created Digitas. Like, like these, you have to have a little risk and even, and I guess with that is you not worrying about knowing everything about the situation. I mean, specifically now in terms of like taking on new jobs or, or, or moving places or making decisions, right? Like you, you're just not, you might not, if you're the kind of person, you might not know everything you want to know before making a decision like that, whether it's career wise or business wise. And you have to get used to a little of that 
you know, the, the true, um, and I'm horrifically afraid of failing. So it wasn't like the classic, don't be afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't want to fail at all like that, that. That's actually not my personality, but, but you have to, so I guess have some confidence and right. have confidence that you might not know everything. And in some ways have confidence, you might not know everything and things will probably work out. They might not, but why wouldn't they? <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's like pretty like basics, like why wouldn't they work out? Like, so, you know, more confidence, less fear, more positivity, less negativity. Um, I mean, the one thing I didn't talk about um, yet, what I just, which maybe underlies all this is this, I, I, I would say just, like integrity in the way that integrity and empathy and the way that you work with people and in environments are two things that are very liberating. If you operate with complete integrity and you never worry about what you told anybody, right? Cause you told them what, what came is the truth, right? You told them the truth. Mm -hmm. So as you run organizations, like you, like just complete openness and integrity is so makes it so easy because that's you're not creating any drama or any fudge factor or anything it's just it is what it is you're an open book kind of thing and everybody knows who you are that was super helpful and then empathy in terms of thinking about others mm -hmm. more than you're thinking about yourself because to be successful you need a great team i don't care who you are you need a great team um so it's not about you it's about your team and therefore about other people I would say those two things probably at a core kind of enabled all this other stuff that, you know, we've been, or that I've been talking about in terms of what's made success. So I would just add those two things as, as things to think about and ways to go about it. It worked for me and it wasn't like stressful or dramatic things just, you know, worked okay. And it's not because I'm that smart. Um, it really isn't. It's not because I'm that smart. So a little, a little confidence, a little risk taking, lots of integrity, lots of empathy. It's a good little mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of hard work. And uh, yeah, sure. yeah, congratulations on all the, the success. And um, we just want to say thank you so much for chatting with us. And just we've been uh, very fortunate to have been able to talk with Ruben for the past few years, you know, as we've grown our businesses. So uh, yeah, it's we'll. A pleasure. We'll Thanks, guys, so much for watching. We're going to be releasing episodes weekly and we're trying to hit the bar so we're gonna peace out be sure to like subscribe all their other things all the social medias comment share retweet copy paste link isn't that the tiktok thing just full send it get it done get it done get us some likes guys hope you guys enjoy <laughs>